Okay, and so then Wireshark launches. One little caveat here, if you have showed the packets as they come in set up in Wireshark, you may not see anything here or you may see just a couple packets. If you go up and hit this refresh button, it'll show you that we are capturing packets currently. So how cool is that? We are actively capturing packets between these two devices in Dynamips. So let's go ahead and bring up the router. Let's, whoops, let's exit from there. I'm on R2. I'm just going to repeat what I just did. I'm going to Telnet to R1 and then issue packet lab as my username password and then I'm going to go into enable mode and I'm going to type out that really long ass password which is top secret password in all caps and so I'm in enable mode and current level is 15 so I can go ahead and do as much damage as I wish so now let's get out of here and let's take a look at the packet capture and see what we can determine from the packets between R2 and R1. Actually before we do that let's jump back over into GNS3 and we're going to right click again and stop the capture and you can see capture stopped. That's one of the weird bits with this is that you're gonna want to stop the capture from GNS3 rather than in Wireshark. Maybe it works for you to stop it in Wireshark but what I've done is I've stopped it in Wireshark before and it continues to capture packets. So uh, just keep that in mind. We don't want to capture any more packets now because we're going to have a buttload of them and we just want to look at the Telnet packets. Okay, so we're back in Wireshark. Go ahead and hit refresh again and you can see we have about 207 packets. We're going to just filter for the Telnet packets and you can see they're right here. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about how to do this or how to use Wireshark. There are some additional videos out there that go through basic Wireshark functionality. So we're looking for packets that were sourced from router 2 to router 1 using Telnet. One real quick and easy way to do that is to grab a packet that is sourced from R2, right click it, say applies filter selected, and you'll see up here what the filter is. And you don't need to know a whole lot about Wireshark to see that the IP source is 10.1.12.2, which is R2. Uh, that's going to give us all the traffic though. So we got Telnet and TCP, um, some other crap going back and forth there. We specifically want the Telnet data. And actually in this case, I'm going to grab a packet towards the bottom here because we actually had two Telnet connections. That was my fault because I had that existing Telnet connection from R2 to R1 that I exited out of before I reestablished that connection. Grab one of the packets down at the bottom here. And in this portion down here, you will see the protocol. Go ahead and right click that, apply as filter and use and select it. So what you're going to do here is you're going to get stuff from R2 using Telnet as the protocol and you can see that reflected in your filter and now you've got your Telnet packets. And the very 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 cool thing is you can go through each one of these packets. Okay so this data Telnet sends each character as an individual packet. So you can sit there and go oh my god alright so W O R D word. One of the cool features of Wireshark is that you can right click on this and follow TCP stream. Again, pick one of the packets towards the bottom. Well, in your case, it's not going to matter because I'm picking one towards the bottom. Not to bore the hell out of you, but just because there actually were two streams. Click this, and how cool is this? This is awesome. So it's showing you the entire conversation, and you could tell that you can pick the um, conversation sourcing from R2 or back from R1 to R2. The reason you're seeing stuff twice here is because that's the echo. So you're typing in a P, it's sending back a P to your uh, terminal emulator in this case. So if you want to clear this up a little bit, we can just go ahead and pick everything sourced from R2 and look at that. So we can see what's going on here. I'm telnetting to this device. Oh, did I hit a capital P first? I must have. Backspaces will kind of mess it up a little bit. But I'm typing in Packet Lab, followed by Packet Lab. So that's my username and password. EN is Cisco IOS for enable. And right there, there's my top secret password. And it's been compromised. So somebody grabs this communication, and it's not that hard to do, really. They can use a tool like Wireshark to figure out what your username, password, and in this case, your enable password are. And now, if they get access to your router, there's nothing stopping them from just completely screwing up your entire router. So that is the big security hole of Telnet. So now let's go ahead and take a look at how SSH handles this. All right, so let's jump on R1. Like I said, this is not going to be a detailed lesson about how to configure SSH, but I will step you through 
the basic SSH configuration here. And the first step is you're going to have to configure an IP domain name. Damn you. <laughs> okay. And in this case, it's going to be Packet Lab. I could type. Wow. Wow. PacketLab.com. Uh, you can choose whatever you want. Uh, try and make it consistent across your devices. And then the second step is going to be creating that cryptographic key that we mentioned in the slides here. And that command. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that exciting when I type but don't talk? The, the command for that is crypto key generate rs general keys modulus, and you have to provide a modulus. Cisco suggests a modulus of at least um, 1024. Again, this video is not to go into detail about how to configure this. I'm just showing this as a quick and dirty. It's going to take a bit to generate that RSA key. And you can see here that SSH 1.99 has been enabled. Not quite two, just 1.99. So that's it. There's really only two commands, technically three, because you have to have a host name, but you do have a host name even if it is router. Like I said, there's another set of videos that goes into this in nauseating detail, but for our purposes, we have made R1 into an SSH server, and we can access it now via SSH. There are a lot of additional steps that you can apply to tighten this down. We're not going to deal with them today. So what we're going to do is jump over to R2, and we're going to SSH to R1. And we're going to do it first just to show you the command set. It's a little different. So you type SSH, you can use your question mark here. What you're going to need to specify is your login name which is going to be that local username on R1, which is Packet Lab, and then the IP address, obviously. And now you're actually accessing R1 via SSH. You notice it just prompts you for password. That's because you've already passed along Packet Lab as your username. And there we go. I'm going to exit from here, and we're going to go ahead and fire up our packet capture. Okay, so I went to GNS3 and had it capture between R2 and R1. I didn't want to bore you with repeating that process again. Wireshark is up and running in the background. Let's go ahead and repeat our SSH. And I use Packet Lab as the password. I'm going to get into enable mode. Top secret password. And we're in privilege level 15. So let's stop here and go over to Wireshark and see what our capture looks like. Okay, and here we are in Wireshark with our SSH capture. I did jump back into GNS3 just so you're not missing a step here. I did stop the packet capture and I did click the refresh button. So now let's go ahead and get our SSH packets. And you can see here that SSH v2 is the protocol that's being used. Notice how it says SSH v2, yet on the command line we had 1.99. Again, I'm going to pimp out this set of videos. Go ahead and check out the configuring SSH set of videos to get more detail on that. All right, let's quickly set up our filter here, the IP address, going down to SSH protocol. So now these are the communications between R2 and R1. And take a look at that Diffie-Hellman key exchange init. So you can see this is our secure communication. Now let's see what happens when we go ahead and pick up one of these packets. And I only had one SSH connection, so I don't have to worry about this. And go ahead and follow the TCP stream. Whoa, so what the hell is this mess? Well, let's see if we can't clear this up a little bit. And let me pull this up so you guys can see it. Go ahead and just have the source to destination of R2 to R1 communication. And you can see here, this is gobbledygook. This bit at the top is the SSH setup, basically. It's exchanging the keys, and now here's all your communications. And as you could tell, it's going to be a whole lot harder for a hacker to decrypt this and find your username password than it was for Telnet. And so that kind of wraps it up. I just wanted to show you guys the difference between Telnet and SSH communications and why, if at all possible, and there really shouldn't be any reason any longer why it's not possible, you should be using SSH in your network. Don't take it from me. Take it from Cisco. They recommend it as well. Okay, as always, I hope this is beneficial, and uh, thank you for joining me in the Packet Lab. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you.